everybody, and welcome to our next video in Unit 13, which is all about solubility. So we've already talked about solutes and solvents and the difference between those two. However, we can also take a look at to what extent do solutes dissolve in a solvent? Because it's not going to be the same for every different type of compound. Some compounds dissolve very well in solution. Some dissolve okay. They might partially dissolve or dissociate. And you might have some substances that barely dissociate or dissolve at all. And that's what we're going to look at here is solubility. And the solubility is the ability for a given substance, which is the solute, to dissolve in a solvent at a given temperature. So in this case, notice it does say dissolve. It does not say dissociate. It could be dissociation, but technically dissolving, many things dissolve, but only certain things dissociate. So it's kind of like that thing, like all squares are rectangles, not all rectangles are squares. <laughs> everything that dissociates dissolves, but not everything that dissolves dissociates. It's kind of something like that. Um, so we're just looking at dissolves in this case. Um, so for example, we can notice that if I have tea, right, um, you can dissolve sugar in tea. However, the amount that that particular sugar dissolves is dependent on a couple of things. And one of those things is actually what's the temperature of the tea. So if you have a hot tea that you just made, you can dissolve a lot of sugar in that tea because, as we remember from gas laws, the temperature of a solution is a measure of its kinetic energy. So the higher the temperature, the more kinetic energy those particles have, which means they can collide with the solute much more frequently, and then it dissolves much faster. So um, you could have hot tea, dissolves a lot of sugar, but if you get iced tea, if you go to a restaurant, they only have unsweetened iced tea, and you try to dissolve sugar in that, that sugar is not going to dissolve, and that's because that Ice tea does not have enough kinetic energy to hit all the sides of the sugar to dissolve it, okay? The same thing goes for hot coffee and iced coffee. You could put a lot of sugar in hot coffee, but if you get that same amount of iced coffee, um, you can't dissolve all of that sugar. And that's why it's important that when you do get an iced coffee, you get liquid sugar, which is just like a saturated solution, which we're going to talk about saturated. Um, it's basically just a saturated sugar solution that has the sugar in it. So it's just a different way of getting that without getting those crunchy sugar particles at the bottom of your iced coffee. You could use that or syrups. So there's a couple of different factors that could affect how soluble a particular solute is. Um, and one of those is uh, increasing the surface area. I have a nice picture to represent this. So if you have some solute particles that are very large, those solute particles can't come into contact with the solvent as much. Because if I have a big hunk of something versus that big hunk that's powdered up, that powder has a lot more surface area which means that the solvent can interact with the, solute, with the solute in many more places than it can if it's the large crystal. And we can see that depicted here in this image. So if I have this large brick of solute, these water particles cannot interact with the outside of this solute nearly as readily as they can if that solute was powdered. So you can take something with a mortar and pestle and grind it up into a powder, that tends to um, increase solubility. You can also agitate a solution by stirring it, right? So you might, I might say, or you might hear me say, stir the solution. You got to stir it for a little bit to get it all to dissolve. Sometimes that will help something dissolve much faster. Or also, like we said, heating a solvent. So heating that solvent increases the kinetic energy. And if, the, if the, that liquid has more translational energy, it's moving around more, moving past one another, it can interact with the solute much more. So sometimes in class, you might see me actually heat up a solution to try to get a solute to dissolve more for that particular reason. 
You might also see me uh, not only heat it up, but sometimes I'll put a stir bar in a solution and put it on one of the hot plates because it has a magnet function that stirs it for me. That's another way that I can get something to dissolve more. And uh, I might also tell you, grind it up into a powder. I might have done that in the Copper Cycle Lab. I don't remember. Sometimes I do that, but that, of course, is to let something dissolve much faster. So let's talk about solution equilibrium. So whenever I do dissolve that solute in a solvent, there's a lot of chemistry that's going on on a molecular level that we don't usually think about um, because it, we don't see it, right? But something very special happens when I am dissolving a solute in a solvent. And especially when you're making your coffee and your sugar, there's a point at which that solvent cannot dissolve any more solution. And we call that the solution equilibrium. So that is when that the amount of dissolved particles is at its maximum, okay? So let's get this definition down here first because it's kind of an interesting process. We don't talk about equilibrium in here, um, but I start to introduce it in this particular section. So opposing processes of dissociation and precipitation start to occur at equal rates. So this means that when I add a solute to something and when that solvent has maxed out at that particular concentration, those other solute particles are dissolving, but they're also re-precipitating at the same time. They're going back on to the solution. We have to remember that even though it doesn't look like something is happening in a beaker, in a test tube, whatever, there's a lot of stuff that's happening that we can't see, right? And this is one of those cases that when I have a solution that's in equilibrium, there's movement that's still occurring on a molecular level. So what does this mean? So when I add my solute to a solvent, okay, that solute is going to start to dissociate um, very readily or dissolve, we could say. Dissolving works here too. But it's going to dissolve or dissociate much faster then it's going to recrystallize. And that's because there's enough water molecules there to dissolve all of that solute. So you'll see here, all of these solute particles are going into the solution. It's starting to dissolve or it's starting to dissociate. As this goes on for a little bit though, that process is going to slow down because there's only so much solute that that water can handle at that particular temperature. So I'll see here, some of my solute in this case has started to dissociate and most of it is still going into the solution. So I see three arrows that are facing up. I have one facing up, another facing up and a third one. But I actually have one coming back on to the crystal because if those solute particles that are already dissolved get into contact with that precipitate again or that solid again, they could actually reform back onto the solid, right? And we call that process an equilibrium, right? When those two things are happening at the same time, it's dissociating at the same rate it is precipitating back on to that solute. So at that particular point, let me move my picture here. So we've reached a solution equilibrium when the amount that those particles are coming off of the solution and dissociating or dissolving is equal to the number of particles that are coming back onto the solvent just because they're close in proximity, right? So this one right here, all the way to the right is your solution equilibrium. The opposing processes of dissociation and precipitation are occurring at equal rates. And you can represent that by showing that the number of arrows going out into the solution, in this case there are two, is equal to the number of arrows that are precipitating back on to the solute. In this case, again, there are two. That is what we call a solution equilibrium. You know that you have a solution equilibrium when you add that sugar to your coffee and 
there's this dissolving stops. If you have solid sugar at the bottom of your hot coffee, you know that your coffee is at solution equilibrium. You need to stop adding sugar to that because you cannot force that coffee to dissolve any more sugar. It's at its maximum. It's at a solution equilibrium. And we call that a saturated solution. So a solution that contains the maximum amount of dissolved solute is described as a saturated solution. If something is saturated, right, it's totally full of something. So um, we say that it's dissolved the maximum amount of solute that is saturated. Whereas if I have a coffee and I don't have any sugar particles sitting at the bottom, that means I have an unsaturated solution because that solution can still dissolve more. You know when you've reached your solution equilibrium, your saturated solution, because you start to get little bits of precipitate that go towards the bottom. No more can dissolve, right? That's when you know you've reached equilibrium. Unsaturated is when there is nothing sitting at the bottom because you could still dissolve more. And here's a really nice image that starts to represent that. So this is sometimes how solubility is shown graphically. So on this side of the graph on my y-axis, I have mass in grams of sodium acetate dissolved in 100 grams of water. And I also have mass in grams of sodium acetate that are added to 100 grams of water. So this is how much is added. This is how much is dissolved. So if I have 100 grams of water, and when I start adding some sodium acetate to that, all of that sodium acetate can dissolve because it's an unsaturated solution. It has not reached its maximum, right? So I'm adding all of that sodium acetate and all of that sodium acetate is dissolving. So notice this is added and then it says dissolving. So then there's a point though, at which no matter how much you add, you can only dissolve so much, which is why we reach its solubility at this point in this graph. The solubility is where the maximum amount of sodium acetate, when all of that sodium acetate that is added dissolves. But that's the point where even though I'm adding more, I'm pointing to the screen like you could see what I'm doing, but even though I'm adding more sodium acetate, I'm not dissolving anymore. So what happens is once I reach this point, all of that extra solute just goes to the bottom because the solution is already maxed out, can't dissolve anymore. When I could still dissolve more, we call that an unsaturated solution. And like I said, you can tell that you have an unsaturated solution because I have nothing sitting at the bottom. I could still take in more. I've reached its saturation point when I have some solid solute sitting at the bottom because it can't dissolve. So it's just going to remain at the bottom. And no matter how much I add, so if I add 100 grams of sodium acetate and if its solubility is 46.4, I'm going to have over 50 grams of sodium acetate that's sitting at the bottom, right? So it depends how much you add. Now, what's really cool is you can force something to dissolve more than it theoretically should. And we can do that by making a supersaturated solution. So a supersaturated solution contains more than the maximum amount of solute that's capable of being dissolved. Well, how the heck do we get that to happen, right? There's a special technique that we have to do. And we can do that by doing this particular process here. So I have my unsaturated solution. So again, let's look at the arrows, right? Unsaturated means that my rates are unequal, right? The rate at which my solute is dissolving or dissociating is greater than the rate that it is recrystallizing. So notice there are one, two, three, four, five arrows coming out of the crystal and one arrow going in those rates are not the same. This has not reached a solution equilibrium. So we call that an unsaturated solution. 
we have reached a saturated solution when the rates of dissolving and precipitation are the same. So if I count these arrows, right, my red arrows coming out, one, two, three, versus my arrows that are going in, one, two, three, are the same. So this is our solution equilibrium. We have reached a saturated solution at that point. I cannot dissolve any more solute. And you could see, because look, I have some solid precipitate sitting at the bottom. Now to get something to actually dissolve more than it technically should, I have to do something to it. And what we do is I have to, oh, I have some of this stuff here. So dissociation occurs faster than precipitation, which we just had, solution equilibrium. Okay, we've said that. Now in order to get that saturated solution to become super saturated, I have to do something to it, like we already said. I have to actually heat it up, but then, I have to actually cool it back down, okay? So I have to heat it up so I could dissolve more because as we said, if I heat something up, the kinetic energy of the solute increases and therefore I can increase the solubility. But then I have to cool it back down because when I cool it back down, that process, you can keep a lot of those solute particles still dissolved in the solution. So once you raise the temperature and you increase the solubility, but when you bring that temperature back down, if the solution is not agitated, you can have more solute dissolved than there technically should be. And we call that a super saturated solution, which you can see here. Everything has dissociated or dissolved. In order to get this super saturated solution back to saturated, what we can do is add a seed crystal, okay? And a seed crystal is just that. You would take a little bit of something, even dust can act as like a seed crystal because it gives the solute something to bond to. It needs like a, a surface to start to attract to in order to precipitate. So I can add a seed crystal and what that does is it forces all of those particles to recrystallize, to precipitate onto the seed. So notice here, if this is my seed crystal in this darker orange color, there's the seed and everything rushes back and then it starts to re-precipitate. And what I'm left with around it, if I notice the color of the solution, this color is the same as this color and I produce back a saturated solution, okay? Because it's only going to dissolve the maximum that it can. It can't have any more than that. So then there's this last part right here. Let me move my picture. It says that recrystallization occurs at a faster rate until solution equilibrium is again reached. This is a really cool thing. There's a lot of really cool YouTube videos. You can look it up on super saturated solutions. But like I said, you're going to do this in a lab, so hopefully you can enjoy it there. So I actually have a really cool picture here. Um, and here it is. So in letter A right here, we have a super saturated solution and you can't tell that it's super saturated just by looking at it because it is optically clear, right? And you can tell a true solution versus a colloid. A colloid has solid particles still suspended in it by shining a light through it. And that's something that I'll show you in class. But this is a super saturated solution. And here's the little seed crystal right here. So we add that seed and notice how all of that excess solute that has dissolved recrystallizes and it forms this really cool solution here at the end. So I have all that extra precipitate, all that extra solute that should not have been dissolved because the solubility of that substance is not that high at that temperature. I have all that extra precipitate and then I have a saturated solution that's surrounding this. And you could see based on this, some solutions you can get really super saturated. You could precipitate a ton of stuff out of that, which is really cool to see. Um, we're gonna do a lab like this in class. I'm really excited. Students usually like to see uh, the super saturated solutions start to precipitate out. And uh, yeah. 
that's going to be it for this video. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know the next time I see you. And uh, I will see you in the next video all about calculating concentration, molarity, and molality of solutions. See you then.